John Lee begins his breath meditation instructions. by telling you to breathe in deeply three times or seven times. So sort of use the wind element in the body to clean things out a little bit. And then allow the breath to find a rhythm that feels right. See where your sense of ease is right now. Which parts of the body feel okay, not tense, not tight. Which may involve a little trick of perception. We do tend to focus on the pains and the tight areas and the, the problems. And we miss the areas that are actually okay. It's like that book called Drawing on the Right Side of Your Brain, where they say instead of drawing a face with Focusing on the eyes or the nose or the mouth. He says, focus on the space between the eyes and the mouth, or between the eyes and the nose. In other words, look at the shapes you ordinarily don't look at, and you find that the drawing comes out a lot better. It's the same with the breath. If you find that you do have a tendency to focus on the pains and the tensions, look instead at the space around them, and give that space some space. In other words, allow it to feel at ease all the way through the in-breath, all the way through the out. If you find yourself tensing up, say, at the beginning of the breath or at the end of the breath, then don't breathe so long. Another common mistake in breath meditation is to try to clearly demarcate the distinction between now is the in-breath, now is the out-breath, with a little bit of tension. to emphasize the line between the two. And that actually doesn't help things. So think of them blending into one another. The in-breath is the same element as the out-breath. Allow the sense of well-being to stay. And don't drop it or step on it or squeeze it up. Give it some space. And you find that as you're giving us some space, some thoughts may come into the mind that if you wanted to focus on those thoughts, you'd have to squeeze off that sense of well-being. Well, you've got to develop a new habit. Realize that the thought is not that important, especially not now, as you're meditating. And you don't have to get involved with it. And as you do this, you're using the concentration for one of its four main purposes, which is to develop a sense of ease and well-being in the present moment. Which of the four motivations is probably the lowest, but it's nothing to sneeze at. We all need this sense of well-being, otherwise we go through life hungry. Hungry for pleasures, hungry for approval, hungry to shore up a particular idea of ourselves. And as long as you're hungry, you really can't see things for what they are. Everything just becomes food, and you gobble it down. Whereas if you can allow the mind to enjoy a sense of well-being, simply in the way you breathe, simply in the way you inhabit the body, what used to serve as food. Now, becomes something that you can look at more objectively. You find that you don't need to feed on all the things that you used to feed on. And that gives you a measure of freedom right there. And you can start looking at the process of feeding more clearly. At the same time, you find that when you have this sense of well-being, it's a lot easier to look at yourself, at your own motivations, your own intentions. We spend so much of our life suffering from the intentions of other people. We're focusing so much on how much we suffer from the intentions of other people that we neglect to look at our own intentions.
and to see how much suffering they're causing. And part of the mind resists this, a very strong part of the mind resists this. We like to think that our intentions are good. There's nothing wrong with our intentions. And yet a huge part of the practice is focused on seeing okay, where our intentions are not skillful. And the only way you're going to look at your own intentions with any degree of equanimity, any degree of fairness, is if you get the mind to settle down and be still and have a sense of well-being, just being right here. I know when I was first staying with the John Fu, I was struck by the sense early on that he didn't trust me. I thought I was a very trustworthy person and felt a little offended. But in my dealings with him, it soon became obvious that I did have some intentions and did have some ideas that were very strongly unskillful, and I hadn't been willing to look at them. When there were problems, it always seemed the problem was out there someplace, in him, in the situation, in the other people in the monastery. And it was only when I was able to gain some sense of well-being and the concentration I could turn around and look at myself and realize, well, the problem is here. This need the mind fields to feed on certain ideas. It's like an animal. If it's not disturbed, it'll feed away with no problem, seem perfectly nice, perfectly normal. If you start pulling away its food, it'll snap at you, snarl. And it's a hard part of our minds to look at. And the best way to do that, though, is to gain this sense of well-being. That allows us to look at ourselves more objectively. So this is why. Practice of concentration or a sense of ease and well-being in the present moment is very important. A lot of people like to go straight to equanimity practice, just watching things arising and passing away. And you can watch things arise and pass away for the whole rest of your life. But if there's no sense of well-being in the practice, you find that you're going to miss a lot of the arisings and the passings away and you're going to miss the really important ones, because you guard them, you hold on to them. So the sense of ease and well-being is the first object, the first goalpost in our practice. It involves having a good, mature attitude towards goals. We work toward it, but at the same time we realize that the seeds for the well-being are already there. It's not that we have to sweat and strain and push them into being, but we do have to be careful. We do have to watch, be sensitive, and show a great deal of restraint in respecting the little pockets in the mind and the little pockets in the body, where there is already a sense of well-being, but we tend to overlook it. So the potential for well-being is already there. It's simply that you have to look very carefully and be very sensitive. That's what the effort is involved in. And once you've got that sense of well-being, then you can use your concentration, as the Buddha says, for three other purposes. One is to gain what he calls knowledge and vision. That's where you develop a sense of light in the body. And that light can become the basis for the different psychic powers, or what they call the higher knowledges. That's one application. The other application is to develop mindfulness and alertness, which the the Buddha defines as being able to see thoughts as they arise, as they stay, as they pass away. 
perceptions as they arise stay and pass away. Feelings as they arise stay and pass away. In other words, you use the state of concentration as a basis for equanimity where you can simply watch events in the mind and try not to get involved in the storylines and the thought worlds that you could create out of them. You want to see them as processes. Now notice the Buddha doesn't say this is insight. It's mindfulness and alertness, just simply tuning into what's actually happening. The insight that gives rise to the end of the defilement is something else. Something else. He calls it the use of concentration that leads to the end of the asavas, which you can translate as fermentations or effluence. And that goes deeper. You don't simply watch things arise and pass away. You gain a larger and larger sense of how much value there is in their arising and their passing away. You come to realize how in the past you've created all sorts of dramas, all sorts of identities, all sorts of worlds out of these things. And yet they're just this, these very fleeting events. As the Buddha says, you learn how to see them as empty, not self. You learn to see them as stress. There's one passage that talks about seeing whatever arises, it's stress arising. Whatever passes away, it's stress passing away. That's not simply just being alert to things as they happen, but it's also getting a sense of their value. The analogy in the canon is of a blind person who's been given an oily, stained rag. He's been told that it's a nice white piece of cloth, and so he treasures it, carries it with him wherever he goes. Then after some time his relatives finally find a doctor that can cure him of his blindness. And the first thing he looks at is the cloth, and he realizes it's, he was misled. What he thought was a nice white piece of cloth is actually a st soiled rag. All the issues and affairs and dreams and worlds and identities and dramas that we build in our lives are made out of oily rags. It's an insight that we don't like to see. But again, it's a lot easier to see it once the mind has had its sense of well-being through the practice of concentration. It's like that Far Side cartoon with a cow standing in a herd of cows as they're eating. It suddenly jerks its head back and spits out its mouth full of grass and says, Wait a minute, this is grass. We've been eating grass. That's what we've been eating in our lives, grass. And it's an insight that goes deeper than just simply watching things arise and pass away. There's another passage where the Buddha says that this is involved in seeing where the allure is in things, but also realizing that their drawbacks are much greater than the allure. We like the dramas. We like the worlds. We have reasons for liking them. But they all fall apart. There's really no substance to them. There's nothing of any real value to them. That insight goes deeper, and you see all the suffering that comes from holding on to these things. That's when you truly understand, as the Buddha says, such is the origination, say, of form or feeling, any of the aggregates. Such is passing away. This is, this is what the aggregates are all about, nothing but grass. Now it sounds depressing. It's like that chant we had just now, and the world is swept away and does not endure. And there are a lot of teachings in the Dharma that are really unpleasant sounding, but they're actually important medicine. It's like some of the most effective medicines are bitter. The Buddha teaches these things not to put a wet blanket on people's lives, on their pleasure, on their happiness. It's to point out, you go through this experience. You put the mind in a position where it really can look at these things square on, and it'll find freedom on the other <coughs> side. The 
Buddhist teachings never end with a negative. It's through the negative to something that lies beyond. So, for example, mindfulness of death leads to the deathless. So the truths that we're going to learn are truths that are hard to learn. Not just about things outside, but also what's going on in our minds. There's something not quite right about the way we feed, the way we feel we need to feed. And as many of the Johns keep saying, it's the problem isn't just with things out there, it's with our intentions, why we're feeding. We have to learn how to become skeptical of our own intentions. And the only way to manage that without feeling disoriented or getting very depressed, getting discouraged, is to have this sense of well-being that comes from the concentration. So that you let go, not out of discouragement, not out of sour grapes, but you let go because you've got something better. And each time you learn how to let go in the right way, you get things get better and better inside. Because the whole point of all these teachings is to find ultimate freedom. And all of the path there involves some harsh lessons in looking at our own ignorance, looking at our own craving and clinging, our own unskillful intentions. It also involves developing skillful intentions, realizing we do have that potential as well, and learning to use that intention wisely, developing a sense of ease and well-being that enables us to do this work in a more balanced way.